pleasure to, to talk to you today. I'm a quantum and matter physicist, and uh, probably I will talk about a topic which is not very well represented in the conference, which is the physics of cuprate superconductors. Um, I will make um, a review of uh, where we are with this, uh, uh, with this very old uh, compound. I uh, mean, it's probably the most studied uh, compounds, set of compounds in, uh, in condensed matter physics. And uh, well, we are not settled yet on the solution. So it's still a mystery. Uh, and um, hopefully I will present a few ideas uh, uh, which are uh, very, um, uh, maybe uh, unusual for this, uh, for this uh, Compound. So this is a most studied, um, what I say, uh, compound in condensed matter physics. Namely, it has more, I think, like 200,000 publications. It was discovered in 87, and since then has been uh, has led to a lot of progress and experiments on uh, theoretical concepts. Also, were uh, provided, uh, which is kind of rare in condensed matter. So I want to dedicate this talk to uh, late uh, Konstantin. Uh, Yefetov was a, a Russian physicist uh, based in Germany, I mean, Soviet, uh, former Soviet Union. And uh, have been uh, part of this work has been done with him in collaboration uh, in the last, uh, say, seven years. Uh, he passed uh, away uh, last August, and this was just a fantastic time uh, working with him. Um, okay, so here is an infamous phase diagram of the cuprates. You don't always see my. Uh, my screen and my my little mouth, and uh, so you see what we see when we see the phase diagram. We see three things. So this is copper oxide, and uh, it's an insulator at low doping. So this is doping in, in oxygen. Then it, it starts to superconduct and very high temperature, and in between we have this phase that we will talk about a lot, which is a pseudo gap phase. Maybe it shouldn't be told uh, the pseudo gap, but maybe the dark matter. Like this is very still mystery. Uh, it's a quantum state of matter. This we know, a mysterious one. And uh, yeah, this mystery is still not solved after 30 years uh, uh, of uh, studies, but almost 40 years now. And here on the right hand side, uh, you have what we call the strange metal phase uh, for cuprates, where transport properties are also extremely unusual. It's maybe even more mysterious on the left hand side. So I'll come back to that at the end of my talk or in the middle, I don't know. So the pseudo gap here. Well, okay, so what's very unusual first, two things. I mean, you have superconductivity close to an insulator, and uh, the highest that we, we have of a superconductor at the moment. And uh, it's close to a magnetic phase. That's something also which is unusual. The pseudo gap was discovered in 89. So two years after uh, this uh, copper oxide superconductor were discovered. And here you see it's NMR. So this is a night shift, uh, which uh, uh, is proportional to spin susceptibility. And you see it decreased in a night shift that those people at that time were able to attribute to a loss in uh, depression in density of states. So why is it so unusual the pseudo gap for, for us? Well, if you look at the band structure of the cuprates, you see like in this figure B, this is kind of uh, a simple band structure. That's also one mystery of cuprates. It's kind of simple. Um, on the left-hand side, if you dope, dope a mott insulator, uh, you will get some little uh, pockets here around the anti-ferromagnetic brilliant zone, which are called the hole pockets. So they have hole-like uh, structure. And on the right-hand side of the doping level here, this is big Fermi surface, very big one, uh, which is typical of Fermi liquid. And here I show what we observe. So on the left-hand side, uh, this is RPS, angle result photo emission. So on the left hand side, they don't, they were never able to do it because it's too much disorder. So these whole pockets have never been observed experimentally. But on the right hand side over there, we see the large uh, Fermi surface, which is typical of a Fermi liquid. 
So family quid theory of uh, Landau uh, is uh, valid seemingly on the right hand side of the phase diagram. And in the middle, we see this weird thing like banana shape that we call Fermi arcs that are schematized uh, in the figure B. And basically it's like um, the electrons are gapless, but only on arcs. It's as if you had taken an eraser and erase part of the Fermi surface in the, what we call anti-nodal region, which is zero pi over there. And this is uh, what we call the pseudo gap. So the pseudo gap opens on the zero pi region over there. And uh, it is um, unusual for theoreticians because uh, we are not used to have Fermi arcs. This breaks Luttinger some rule. So we used to count the number of particles by the volume of the Fermi surface uh, here. And uh, here we don't have volume. So does it mean that the arcs are closing backwards and we don't see the back uh, because of, uh, I mean, some kind of, uh, let's say some kind of uh, multiple interference in our face or is it that it's big Fermi surface large Fermi surfaces and fluctuations or some type of things have erased the anti-nodal region so here again a new version of phase diagram uh, by uh, Brad Ramshaw it's function of all doping and uh, I'd like to classify all the theoretical effort that has been done in uh, over the years in three broad categories. So it will be a broad classification. They are not exclusive of one another, but I think it will kind of shed of light of the way people have attacked this, uh, this problem during uh, all those years. So first, as I said, what you see is a Mott insulator. So this is a, a meaning that uh, electrons are extremely strongly correlated there. Uh, typical energy for correlation of electrons is one electron volt over there. On the right hand side, uh, it's Fermi liquid. So we could claim that there is a QCP, quantum critical point, under the dome. Namely, the pseudo gap would be a real phase transition, which would be ending at zero temperature, producing a lot of fluctuations uh, at this uh, quantum critical point. So namely, we would say like this phase transition, we don't know the other parameter. It might be very complex, very unusual. But uh, once we would know what it is, we will uh, solve the mystery of the gap. So here you see an enhancement of a specific heat uh, divided by temperature, which is proportional to uh, the fluctuation. Uh, so this is kind of... Uh, experimental uh, incentive that we have a, indeed a quantum critical point under the superconducting dome. And last but not least, um, I mean, the pseudo gap might just be due to some uh, fluctuations. Uh, it's basically the, the part I prefer. So, I mean, as I said, it's not exclusive. If you reach a, a metal insulator transition, particles will localize, namely the phase will start to fluctuate by Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. It's a very simple me quantum mechanical uh, statement. So you'll get a lot of fluctuations in the proximity to a Mott insulator. And moreover, it's very anisotropic material. So you might have quantum fluctuations due to the reduction of dimension. So let's go a bit more in details. The first one, a strong coupling, and this was uh, the prominent uh, theory, uh, uh, basically uh, put forward by Phil Anderson, uh, who two, almost one year and a half, uh, I mean, not even a few months after discovery of cuprates, put forward this very brilliant and unusual idea of a resonating valence bond. So pairs uh, forms at different distance and superpose themselves and fluctuate. And this would be the solution or the solution of pseudo gap. So it's strong coupling. It would mean that the electron is fractionalizing between a spinon and a holon. And this is uh, protected by a constraint, which ensures that the number of uh, degrees of freedom per site uh, is uh, conserved. So here, the spinons are uh, represented by fermions and holons by bosons, but you could reverse the representation. And you have an emergent uh, gauge field, uh, U, uh, U1 in that case, but you could have a SU2 uh, version of it. 
So how do you describe the pseudo gap in this phase diagram? Uh, well, the spinons, they are pairing, uh, like a D wave pairing of Cooper pair, but it's on these spins and below this red line over there. And uh, here you have this uh, uh, particular hole of spinons, which is this uh, uh, black line here. And the holons, they are condensing below the blue line over there. So when one of the two species condense, this is reconfining. And so below uh, the blue line and the red line, you have uh, confining. And since you have pairing, you will get the Cooper pair. So it will make a superconductor. On the uh, top of it here, uh, you would get this uh, preformed uh, pairing of spinons, which is this valent bond spin liquid. And uh, uh, namely, this pseudo gap is a spin liquid for Anderson. So, this uh, type of theory was studied for many years. Uh, there was a point where I, I suppose you, it was difficult to get uh, a uh, kind of a job if you didn't uh, go in this direction. Astro correlation are, are supposed to be extremely strong and fractionalize the electron uh, integrity into this elementary uh, carries of uh, spinons and holons, charge and spin. I don't believe in it personally for one reason. Is like ARPES has seen inside the superconducting phase, but in the pseudo gap phase, ARPES has seen very beautiful Bogolubov quasi particle in the antinodal region. So, remain this antinodal region is supposed to be a pseudo gap. And in a pseudo gap, you're supposed to have your electron to be fractionalized. But, well, okay. So, namely, this pseudo gap uh, is completely reconfined inside the superconducting phase. And uh, we can see the Bogolubov excitations over there. Uh, which imply that the quasi-particle, uh, the electrons at least, has its own ant integrity in, in order to form the Cooper pair. So the third, the second part I want to talk about is a QCP under the dome. So it's not such a crazy idea. You have it everywhere in condensed matter physics. Basically, take heavy fermions here, uh, magnetic, um, transition and above magnetic transition you generate a superconductor this is very common namely the pairing is not electron phonon it's just anomalous what we call anomalous superconductor and very unusual ones and the pairing is due to antiferromagnetic correlations they're usually d wave uh, they can be p wave like in this case where actually the magnetism is not antiferromagnetic but ferromagnetic one and uh, if you look at the nictite, all the nictite family have again antiferromagnetism and superconductivity in the dome. Here is this um, new heavy fermions as a valence transition here, density transition, superconductivity, antiferromagnetism. So this is not a very common thing, and it could very well be uh, that uh, although uh, it's not really antiferromagnetism we have for cuprates, we have another type of phase transition. Like here we see we could have a density transition. and um, uh, superconductivity is generated by a fluctuation of the order parameter that will uh, favor the pairing of the Cooper pairs. So last one, fluctuations. So it's also a very old idea. Uh, so here paper is 95, but uh, Vic Emery and Steve Kevelson has brought not only them, I mean, a lot of uh, theoreticians have gone to this uh, this idea, which fluctuations have to be there. So basically what they did is they suppose that we have a BKT transition uh, for uh, the cuprates. Uh, namely, uh, you get a mostly two dimensional superconductor and, and you get the temperature transition by forming vortices. So it's vortex anti vortex that form uh, pairs of uh, topological defects and you will reach TC this way. And there is a strong experimental evidence for that, which we call UMRA plot, which been revived by Chris Holmes in 2014, uh, 2004. Later, you have a good version of this plot. So you plot the superfluid density here as a function of TC, and you see it's beautiful linear in T, uh, which is typical of BKT transition. This is basically most experimental proof that we have vortices, anti-vortices, and fluctuations. Uh, at TC. Uh, what Emery and Kivelson did, and they, they, look, uh, they found a way uh, by looking at the temperature max at which occurs 
uh, the vortices compared to TC. And then they were able by this way for different various uh, superconductors to uh, give an idea of what is uh, the rigidity of the conductor and superconductor. And you see that the phase rigidity for YBCO is uh, maybe 10 to the power five less than for a superconductor like lead. So there is a huge uh, difference with uh, normal metal superconductor for phase rigidity. So, okay, fluctuations are there. So it was a huge uh, set of, um, of uh, very good phenomenology, especially this is good for the Fermi arcs because it describes very well the closing uh, of the Fermi arcs with the temperature. So with, when we reach T star, the Fermi arcs here are closing and give big, big Fermi surfaces above T star. Um, but then there was a study of uh, Nernst effect, which is able to, uh, uh, to assess uh, what is, uh, what is um, the, the, about the presence of uh, vortices, because you have a special uh, Nernst effect, which has a special sign depending um, on the presence of uh, vortices. So there was a first experiment by Ong saying that, okay, the vortex are present very, very high in temperature, very close to T star. So namely the fluctuation should be responsible, uh, phase fluctuations should be responsible for pseudo gap. But then there was another set of studies in YBCO where this temperature was assessed to be uh, close to TC actually, not going up to T star. So this controversy was resolved and apparently uh, these uh, people around uh, Cameron Benia and uh, Louis Taifer, and they were uh, correct. Uh, here, the mistake that was made, uh, if I can say so, that we can get experimental mistakes, is that you have two types of carriers, as we will see that also the charge carriers are present and they scatter uh, through modulations, which basically in this compound by chains have the same sign as the vortex contribution to the Ernst effect. Uh, here, the sign is opposite, so we were able to disentangle, those guys were able to disentangle the two effects and uh, now we know fluctuations are strong, phase fluctuations, but they don't lead, to, uh, they don't go up to T star, so they cannot explain the pseudo gap. Okay, so since I like fluctuations effect, uh, I would like to uh, continue a bit. So when you have a condensate, uh, you can have phase fluctuations, which were what we were talking about, but you could also have uh, amplitude fluctuations or fluctuations of uh, more composite order parameter. So there brings me to uh, recent developments here, uh, which is the ubiquitous observation of charge order in the phase diagram cuprates. So since with a the year, there are a lot of experimental progress in these compounds, the phase diagram has become richer and richer, uh, especially uh, below T star, there's a lot of discrete uh, phase transitions of discrete type with anomalous care effect, both in terms of symmetry, time reversal symmetry, sorry, here at the low doping, you have a glassy behavior. Uh, you have what I say, the incipient uh, charge modulations below T star in most of the compounds. Uh, we know that the wave vector is basically uh, close, uh, very close uh, to uh, this uh, nesting wave vector of the anti-nodal region. And we know we can stabilize it uh, with magnetic field, which is very unusual. And uh, this under magnetic field gives a true long range order, uh, which is almost no disorder, and uh, with a very nice bright peaks. Uh, at T star, in terms of discrete phase transition, pneumaticity has been observed, uh, loop currents, inversion symmetry by torque uh, experiments. So it sounds that we have uh, some much more complex phase diagram, which some parasitic orders. So something typical of uh, this compound is you have a lot of degeneracies, namely, uh, I mean, you have antiferromagnetism, but you have also charge modulation, but you have also some kind of uh, uh, concomitant discrete phase transition, which can appear at higher temperature and could give also a QCP under the dome, if we think of it. So competing orders, uh, charge modulation, strong competition with spare conducting state. We know that from the beautiful uh, STM experiments of Osman and Kapitulnik in 2002, 
So do you do STM in these compounds? I see nothing, probably you see nothing. But when not, these people do is they subtract eight uh, Tesla data from zero Tesla data. And then suddenly, magically, you see the vortices with abricots of lattice over there, beautiful. And inside the vortices, you see the modulations. And this is typical, you see, uh, inside the vortices, you should see what the normal phase is made of, basically what competes with superconductivity. Let's say for years, when people were doing theories of uh, RVB, of fractionalized, I mean, they were asking STM guys, do you see antiphormagnetic? inside and uh, do you see let's say a loop currents inside do you see uh, inside the vortices uh, let's say uh, uh, d density wave well basically they saw something which is charge modulations it's simpler than those uh, complex theories but it's charge modulations so we have to uh, models uh, uh, nature provide us with strong competition, with a coexistence of superconductivity and charge, uh, charge orders. They say in the, in the selenium or niobium triselenide, niobium diselenide case, uh, we see here the charge orders in blue and superconducting orders in red. Difference with cuprate, as you will see shortly, is that there is a factor of five uh, between uh, the two, between the charge order and the superconducting order. In cuprates, they will be much of the same order of magnitude. Uh, another recent STM experiment, which is uh, quite unusual. Uh, here is a phase slip of charge modulation that you can see over there with a phase depending on R. And this distribution typical that they see at zero temperature of uh, they are at four Kelvin inside superconducting phase, there is superposition and coexistence between superconductivity and charge modulation. And see distribution of phase is super random. Like it goes from minus one to one. Now what they subtract, a Tesla, zero Tesla, you see the vortices and the charge modulation inside. But very strangely, the phase slip uh, becomes ordered. And this is on the very long range, uh, basically the size of a sample. Namely, the amplitude is short range of the charge order, but the phase is long range. How about that? I mean, this is something that you have never seen anywhere. It's very unusual. So like uh, the phase uh, has longer, I mean, two order of magnitudes, roughly longer range of correlation than the charge. Uh, yeah, probably two orders of magnitude. So in order to account for this uh, idea, we get, uh, that's the work we did with Constantine. Uh, we get an idea of uh, an emergent symmetry. Uh, say you have two orders like in chemistry, which are degenerate. Uh, uh, like in chemistry, you have that a lot. Like you see, you have a state which is degenerate and can get split, for example, with magnetic field. You sometimes have an emergent symmetry which enables you to rotate between uh, one order and the other one. Now here, we take these two orders like uh, bond density wave. So, uh, well, we call it quadrupole here, density wave and superconductivity. And the rotation between the two uh, will be typical, typical SU2 group over there. So this allows for a constraint, and this constraint will be responsible for the opening of a pseudo gap at T star. Uh, here's a paper that we did in 2013 with uh, Constantine and co workers. Typically, the effective field theory for this emergent symmetry ID is a nonlinear sigma model. Uh, we see the constraint here, the fluctuations, SU, SU2 symmetry uh, fluctuations, and we were able to find a model, sorry, a model where uh, the symmetry is exact. And see here's a Fermi surface of the cube rates, and here is the antiformatic zone boundary. So when they cross, you have wet what we call hot spots when antiformatic zone is big and electrons can see it even at zero temperature. And around these hot spots, uh, if you look at the model with uh, simple interaction, the SU2 symmetry is exact. In D equal two, you have particle, particle, and particle hole uh, pairing formation, and uh, they can, are completely degenerate. Namely, you can rotate from one to another, and the order parameter, sorry, <laughs> that is forming uh, and gives rise to non-zero value for the sum of the two amplitudes uh, is. Uh, superposition of the two other parameters there. 
So to have an exact solution for an idea is always nice. And this is what we got at the time. And this will uh, open a gap in the Fermi surface in the Antal Northern region. So ideas of emergent symmetries, uh, they are not new, they are apart from these fluctuation ideas. There was a huge uh, set of, uh, of uh, body of, uh, of theories uh, around uh, Su Shen Zhang, also passed away a few years ago, and uh, Eugene Demler, 2005, called the SO5, SO5 group. So SO5 is rotating between superconductivity and antiferromagnetism. So then you have 10 generators of the group because of the three uh, generators of the antiferromagnetic group over there. Also, we know that at half filling, you have uh, exact SU2 symmetries uh, over there at half filling. And this was used even in a strong coupling version. Instead of having a U1 gauge theories, you had SU2 gauge theories. So SU2 symmetry uh, at half filling is basically the same as ours. So half filling, uh, you have a S wave uh, and a pi, uh, pi pi charge density wave. Uh, but uh, for whole dope, this was gener generalized with SU2 group by uh, Ron Patrick Lee and Chao uh in the old days. So it was a SU2 gauge theory. So you fractionalize electrons, but you keep the SU2 symmetry group. So here, what we do, we don't fractionalize the electron. And we just have this ro simple rotation between uh, charge and wave and uh, superconductivity. Uh, concept of SU2 symmetry. So this is for the half field case, uh, this beautiful paper by Yang and Zhang in 89, uh, also very soon after discovery of cuprates. So here is the L equal one representation uh, with two uh, superconducting order parameter because they have a phase and one for the charge uh, density um, with modulation, which is breaking translational symmetry. And we see that uh, the rotation can be described by the so the spin operator, which uh, goes from one state to another here, L1 representation of a pseudo spin. Uh, and then uh, for, uh, uh, for Christoph, um, this is a pseudo spin. So basically it will be, uh, behave like a spin, um, but uh, this is less robust than a spin. This is topological uh, concept and it has a chirality nonlinear sigma model. Um, and uh, it can, the topological defect can be protected from disorder. It will be very resistant to disorder, but uh, uh, this is uh, always a bit less. Uh, you see the constraint is emergent. It's not as robust as nature provides you a spin. Then, I mean, uh, the, the constraint on the, on the fluctuations of the, on the axis of the, the three axis of the, of the spin operator is very strong stronger than this one. Okay, effect of magnetic field is very unusual in this material. As I said, charge order is stabilized by magnetic field. Here is a ultrasound experiment showing it. You see magnetic field above 17 Tesla. You stabilized three dimensional now charge order, uh, uniaxial. And what is very unusual is see this temperature uh, temperature uh, is non-existent, so it's flat. So it goes from superconductivity, coexistence, but charge order is, is going poof like that in one way with no temperature dependence. So this is typical of what we call, uh, like if you have a magnetism, you have antiferromagnetism magnetism and magnetic field perpendicular to it. We, we have a, what we call a spin flop transition Namely, it's not really a phase transition, it's more like a first order or, uh, kind of flip. You know, the spins are, let's say, in X, Y plane. You put a magnetic field perpendicular, perpendicular to, to them. And suddenly after, when magnetic field is big enough, the, the spin starts to flip in a direction of the magnetic field. Uh, so that was uh, very encouraging to us because of course we don't have spins and magnetic field, but if we have pseudo spin, we could have a pseudo spin flop transition over there. And uh, as I told you before, like it's very typical of superconduct, uh, this high TC, that the maximum value of the charge order, you can see it here as well, is of the same order of magnitude as the superconducting order parameter. So there, there are people believing that a charge order is an epiphenomenon, but still, uh, if it's an epiphenomenon, then why is the transition temperature of the same order as the superconducting uh, temperature uh, here? 
So my belief, uh, it's still a belief, uh, is not an epiphenomenon. And um, we checked uh, this phase diagram uh, with a spin flop, pseudo spin flop transition within the nonlinear sigma model. So the nonlinear sigma model, what it has, it has a constraint uh, between the various, uh, the two orders here. So the constraint uh, is making you uh, this uh, flatness naturally. If you instead you use a Ginzburg Landau to modelize the data, you need to fine tune like crazy uh, to get the flat uh, the flat region. Moreover, you will never be able to get with a Ginzburg Landau the coexistence that we get naturally within the nonlinear sigma model if we break a little bit the SU2 symmetry. So this was working very well. Uh, we were uh, kind of, uh, I think it's one of the nicest uh, set of data showing that the competition between those two orders is a bit more um, than uh, just uh, ginsburg landau competition that we could get, for example, in now now beyond diselenite or other uh, compounds. So as you say, pseudospin, uh, pseudospin here, like in three dimension, will naturally have a topological texture like you will get in magnetism with your beautiful skirmion. Um, it's not been observed, but uh, this is one of the predictions of the model. It's fancy. It's a skirmion in pseudo spin space. We can, since topology is super fashionable, we decide to, to be part a bit of this fashion <laughs> uh, here. This is the analogy with SX, SY, SE. And again, we naturally have for free uh, that inside the vortex, uh, since uh, the scammer is in a pseudo spin, you see this topological structure provides some modulation inside the vortex. Uh, this is, was the first thing that was seen. And actually, when you talk to experimentalists in cuprates, they are very much uh, uh, convinced by this type of uh, things. They like it, like, uh, like for free, the theory, the theory is based on what you see. Uh, so we took this as a basic fact. So we classified the factors of what we were seeing uh, with the help of uh, an experimentalist we, we could talk to, who were able to listen to, to us and interact with us. So we say, what is important, what is less important? Everyone is making his own ID. For example, I believe fluctuations are important. Charge order is important. And I mean, the, the quasi-degeneracy between charge order and superconductivity is important, then the idea of emergent symmetry was kind of natural. Okay, another idea that we got in the same line with exactly the same sets of experiments that we will explain for the pseudo gap is the fractionalization. But this time, not of an electron. You see an electron is an elementary particle, it's tough to, to break. And you need strong coupling. You need a very, very fancy theory uh, to break an electron. We decide to break something which is not very stable in nature, with namely what we call a pair density wave. I mean, it will be easier to break something which is fragile. So again, I go back to this old idea of a slave boson with fractionization of the electron between charge alone and spin on, recalling you that uh, a constraint is protecting the degrees of freedom and uh, an emerging uh, a U1 gauge field uh, which is uh, also ensured uh, 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 by the presence of the constraint will be present in the system. Uh, here, we do the same type of thing with fractionalizing, not a fermion, but a boson. So our boson is a particle-particle pair, which is modulated in space here. Uh, so it has two elementary symmetries, a uh, particle hole, which is uh, represented by this particle-particle uh, pair here, and breaking of translation symmetry, particle-hole pair, which uh, modulation breaks translation symmetry. So pair density wave can be written in terms of operators as a commutator of the two elementary operators, and a constraint will protect this fractionization uh, here, the same type of constraint. So this is charge two translational symmetry, which will be what we see. You see, again, so we look at what we see. We see a superconductivity as, as, as a main order. So let's say here it's in a real space and it's particle-particle uh, pair, so it's just a Cooper pair, uh, uh, which is Galilean invariant. And here is the operator which will break translational symmetry, um, uh, which has a modulation of the charge that was observed experimentally. 
we have an emerging gauge field for the constraint. And this is our ansatz for the pseudo gap, which was the same as the one we got uh, with SU2 symmetry. But uh, there is no SU2 symmetry here. It's, there is an emergent gauge field, which is a bit more fancy theory. So uh, superposition. So it's an entanglement of the two orders plus a constraint. Superposition plus a constraint means the two orders are entangled. So they are in competition, but they are uh, entangled. They are also in superposition. So the competition is a bit more fancy. Some people have said like uh, the QCP of the cup rates and the phase diagram is the most entangled the QCP uh, in the world, like people like Jan Zanen, I mean, big thinkers in the field, I mean, big, big shots, I mean, in the field, they all have their theory. So here we, we take this idea of entanglement, but we decide to entangle two orders only, two orders that we see that we know are present in the system. Uh, the assumption we met is charge is not an AP phenomenon uh, to be entangled and meaningly entangled girl with the superconductivity, it has to be of the same order of magnitude. So again, like uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the SU2 emergent ID, here the effective filter is a chiral model, but it's a chiral rotor. So it's basically non linear it's equivalent. You can show, like, you pay, for example, a paper by Perelomov. Uh, the old day, old papers that this is equivalent to a CP1 model. So basically, it's not only a SMA model plus a gauge fields, uh, this famous emerging gauge fields. And here, then we have an emerging gauge field with a confining transition. So confining, deconfining, this is a pseudo gap. And uh, below TC, when we have the first real long range order, all the phases freeze. And uh, on the right hand side, in the strange metal phase here of the cuprates, so we will get incoherent bosons. We'll come back to it. So we get this uh, uh, elementary, uh, by elementary ID, we get this experiment for free with this ID. Namely, if you just get here below TC, the phases freeze of the two orders. But you see those two orders, they are very weird. One is inert to the, uh, is neutral to electromagnetic field, which is the charge modulation. The other one, uh, the delta, is active to electromagnetic field. If you put electromagnetic field, you get Mesner effect. So below TC, in the, the phase of the two get locked, and they freeze, and they get locked. This one will become active. So basically, in terms of symmetry, the charge uh, density wave will become like a pair density wave. So it's a reconfining, in a sense. So, uh, okay, despite that, uh, then we get long range coherence of the spin flip of the phase because it is locking to superconductivity. So that's our idea there. We get it for free, but this, this is uh, idea of locking of the two phases. Again, there is, a, as I said, analogy with SU2 symmetries uh, with the same constraint for the two models. So it's the same type of ansatz, but it's different ways to reach into it. So I'll go to the strange metal, and it's one of the biggest mystery of cuprates. It's this metallic phase here, uh, but usually a fermi liquid has a resistivity going like T square. And here, uh, for uh, three decades of energy, uh, like uh, two decades, let's say, you have resistivity beautifully going linear in T. It's extremely notoriously difficult to get by any uh, theories of condensed matter. Namely, when we start to work on the strange metal phase, we were looking at the papers, and although you have 200,000 papers on cuprates, on the strange metal phase, theoretical papers, there are very few. They are like um, maybe 15. I mean, just to get one theory, to get the linear resistivity, one transport theory, this is notoriously difficult. So our idea, this is called the Plankan regime for resistivity. Uh, recently, it was an analogy with holography where are growing strong, it has a minimal viscosity. Uh, and we know from day one of superconductivity, which is a quasi drood like uh, conductivity, namely the optical conductivity as a function of frequency has a drood behavior. Uh, with a time uh, going like one over T. So the linear and T resistivity is also seen in terms of optical uh, conductivity within a drew the behavior with, for which the width is proportional to the temperature. The drew the peak width is proportional to the temperature. Well, then there was this uh, controversy uh, outlined by Anderson 
Uh, it's like if you look at the whole uh, cotangent hole conductivity, sigma xx over sigma xy. If you look at family quid, it's uh, written like n e t two uh, tau over m. But then the tau is in t square. Uh, tau minus two, tau minus one is in t square. So it's, it seems as if you have two lifetimes, one lifetime going uh, like uh, one over t, and one lifetime for the electron going like one over t square. This is a conundrum for cube rates. Uh, I mean, this one was kind of a, this unsolvable mystery of condensed matter, maybe tougher than the pseudogram because transport, I mean, it's usually difficult, notoriously difficult to beat the T square for, for conductivity. So recently, there were a study of a whole conductivity for which we could get the number of carriers. Then two groups, the group of Louis Taifer and the group of Nigel Hassi. Uh, so they go to with a group of Nigel Hussey that the number of carriers goes from small hole pockets here, like uh, P, to big Fermi surface over there. So the same data, but uh, interpretation differs, like uh, they don't completely agree. They agree on the, on the data, which is already something for the two groups, but they don't agree in the interpretation. So the group by Nigel Hussey told us, like, maybe we have another type of carrier, uh, which will res be respond. Uh, uh, seen uh, like uh, uh, for this uh, very gradual, uh, uh, very gradual uh, going from p to one plus p over there. So this uh, new type of carrier, it should have h over t scaling. Uh, it's isotropic into b. It's incoherent, so it doesn't participate to sigma x y, and it has a Planckian limit, namely it participates to linear interresistivity. So we decide to try oh, our best idea was like in our theories, uh, since we fractionalized per density wave, we have charged two bosons, which are extremely well formed uh, in the strange metal regime above the deconfining transition. So why could we get uh, uh, this uh, uh, boson? So we have a very uh, recent experiment by Mitrano et al. I think this was even 2019, I made a mistake. And see, this is compressibility. So it's Mills experiment with compressibility over there. And you see a plateau, but the, the size of the plateau, if you look at this omega here, is mostly very close to this 0 0.8, 0 0.9 electron volt. Namely, it's the size of a strong uh, Coulomb uh, repulsion on site of roughly one electron volt. If you uh, look at that and this data and, and give to one of your best uh, friend who does statistical physics, he says, oh, but this is a jamming transition. So, okay, I don't know what it is. This is a huge energy scale, like it's an elephant. It's an elephant in the strange metal phase seen by the Mills experiment. This huge energy scale here uh, could be due to that you form bosons at high energy and they interact within each other and they jam. So they provide this plateau of uh, jamming, like jamming uh, when you have a traffic jam uh, on the street. So these bosons, they have been observed recently uh, with a pair tunneling uh, in uh, LSEO. They look at the noise, sorry, sorry. I just uh, didn't put many words in these transparencies. So this is uh, E over V, like it's pair tunneling, and this is a noise. And they claim they see uh, charge two particles over this whole phase diagram regime. So we decide to do a transport uh, calculation with a uh, Kubo formalism uh, with uh, charge two bosons. To our uh, dismay and surprise, it's never been done before, which is also typical of cuprates. You go to one line of thoughts and you develop theories. But then we change the line of thoughts with putting bosons everywhere and especially charge two bosons. And it's never been looked at. For example, nobody has looked whether they could form at high, at high energy, very close to one EV. So the energy of the Hubbard model or Triban Hubbard model, uh, whether bosons could be formed there, nobody has looked at it. And this is some answer that we can get uh, theoretically, uh, probably. So it's something we did with our uh, postdoc and ORAC. And so the bosons, they interact with the uh, super fermions. So they have two types of particles. They are incoherent, so they don't participate to whole conductivity. So the idea to explain the mystery of the cuprates would be that bosons uh, would kind of short circuit the transport uh, for linear resistivity. And on the other side, you have a fermion soup, 
which could be responsible to sigma xy going like t, uh, sigma xy over sigma xx having a t square a lifetime. So uh, very uh, fortunately, uh, like I mean, we were very nicely having linear temperature dependence uh, in 2D for discharge two bosons. Uh, and also a quasi drude uh, conductivity, so linearity for the drude. Uh, so this was uh, very encouraging. So now we're trying to do with uh, other type of technique like the memory matrix, which is a bit more like hydrodynamic uh, technique rather than the Kubo. Uh, since the bosons are, are very incoherent, it's difficult to have a Boltzmann treatment of them. Uh, they have a finite Q, which is important. And uh, we need, uh, in order to have something uh, that is working, that there is a collapse with the lattice, so there is a coupling to the lattice. So we need that they are extremely well formed, these Cooper particle particle pairs uh, at high energy. So we are, within this theory, we got a lot of prediction. I will go very quickly since I have uh, still a few minutes, uh, I think. Uh, we took a very simple toy model. So this is uh, maybe the weakness. Uh, we got uh, no microscopic model, but in the toy model, uh, we could uh, put uh, uh, by hand the G and V, uh, V, uh, we put uh, next nearest neighbor uh, interaction, Coulomb interaction uh, for electrons in order that the charge is a little bit winning over superconductivity. And we decouple and put the strong coupling by uh, Gutzfeller technique. And uh, compare the formation and condensation energy of the pseudo gap, namely, remember it was a constraint, and each of the others separately. And uh, one of the good things we could get, it's indirect experiment, is uh, uh, this is the opening of the pseudo gap formation in bismuth to 201. And we got some very nice uh, fitting with the data with the back banding uh, of the. Uh, the, the pseudo gap is forming not at KF, a bit away from KF, but the band is, is bending back uh, like that. So there is a kind of Q square scale, in, at least in this compound information of pseudo gap. We check also in the spectral function that our constraint was opening the gap. And this fitting with experiment is pretty good. So this I pass, it's a link with the MFT. I just go to Raman scattering, which is also pretty nice experiment. To see Raman scattering is nice because it enables you to scan uh, the Fermi surface in a reciprocal space. Uh, basically, due to the symmetries of the Raman scattering, you can scan, let's say, the antinodal region of the Fermi surface with B1G and the nodal region with B2G. So, in the antinodal region, you see the superconducting gap opening and the pseudo gap. And in the nodal region, recent paper, they claim that they can see with an excitation peak the value the, of the amplitude of the charge density wave gap, which is the only experiment uh, which is able to see it uh, so far. And uh, very uh, uh, intriguingly, they saw that this amplitude, they claim the amplitude of the charge gap is of the same magnitude as the one of the superconducting gap, uh, which goes very well with this idea of emergent and two symmetry or this ideas of uh, entanglement of the two orders of fractionalized pure density wave. Uh, here is uh, the scale that they attribute to the formation of the pseudo gap. So within uh, our uh, small uh, model, we were able to get the two order of same order of magnitude. Uh, we can explain phonon softening, which is also super anomalous in this compound. So you see when you have charge order, you usually see phonon softening uh, below the ordering of, uh, of the charge. Here is a typical piles. Uh, where the charge is ordering at this wave vector, and you see the phonon is softening at this wave vector. Here, cuprate C, the phonon softening, but below TC, superconducting. So what does at the wave vector of the charge, but below superconducting? It's a very nice phonon softening, but it's below TC and not T charge. So why? So we got it within our model by saying uh, that the phases are looking only below TC, and you have a lot of phase fluctuations above TC. Okay, these are my conclusions. So we have an idea of entangling uh, two other parameters that have been seen experimentally, namely particle-particle and particle-whole-order parameter. We're trying to get uh, direct uh, prediction, a smoking gun experiment for this idea uh, through Josephson effects and uh, maybe uh, through some noise as well in the charge system. Uh, some theories will maybe, uh, this is our prediction of uh, 
bosons at uh, high energy in this system, we might be able to check that uh, theoretically as well. With this, I will thank you for your attention and take your questions if there is any. Thank you very much for your presentations. Are there any questions? Yes, maybe can I have one question? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the more I listen to your presentation, the more I know that I, I so I know that I know almost nothing actually. <laughs> so the first question is, so uh, the pairing mechanisms, uh, so do you suggest there are different pairing mechanisms corresponding to different regions of this uh, phase diagram? Uh, or is, is that one universal pairing mechanism? Because in, in low temperature superconductors, the pairing is by phonons, right? And so do you have any hypothesis or theory about pairing mechanisms in, in high TC superconductors? Yeah, actually, this is a very good question. I'm, I'm sorry, in my review, I didn't, uh, I, I don't address uh, this topic. Uh, the pairing mechanism is something that we almost have a consensus now. Uh, so this is uh, not, uh, it's, it should be due to the antiferromagnetic, uh, antiferromagnetism, which naturally predicts a D wave superconductor. Uh, maybe there's a bit of S wave still under debate, but um, no, the idea here is that the pairing is due to antiferromagnetic uh, uh, interactions, uh, which provide a very nicely D wave superconductor and also provide uh, uh, actually a, a charge density wave. If you take the toy model we had, for example, here, but this is a consensus. It's very few consensus on these compounds. Uh, it's one of them. <laughs> So, 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 it was so a it... highly debated like uh, in the early days and it was a huge, huge, huge fight between uh, S-Wave and D-Wave. And it happened in this history of this fight that uh, the idea, so you see uh, this material is extremely disordered and TC is very high. And it is notorious since the work of Anderson that S-Wave pairing is insensitive to disorder. So Anderson and uh, Varma and other people say like it has to be S-wave because it doesn't react to disorder. And uh, there were all people around David Pine saying like, look, the antiferromagnetic interactions are so strong that they will lead to D-wave pairing. So Pines was correct. Uh, I think he just for that, maybe he should have got the Nobel prize. Uh, and what happened is like uh, theories of disorder completely uh, overestimated the influence of disorder on a D-wave superconductor. They completely uh, overestimate it. Namely, this is the estimation was difficult. So this is a typical overestimation of the role of disorder. So there is a consensus now it's D-wave. Uh, and if you look at the mechanism, I can show you, unfortunately I don't have uh, the real, uh, for example, the review by Patrick Lee, you will be able to find it. But even in our little uh, toy model, like say here, you see I take uh, C and G. So this is antiferromagnetic correlations. You can decouple into uh, the particle particle channel or particle whole channel. And particle particle channel, if you solve the gap equation, you need to be D wave or you get nothing. Are you familiar with Professor Spawek's work from Jagiellonia University? He, he, he deals with this same Hubbard. This is TJ model, which you are showing, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, anyway, he's one of the guys that works on it. Uh, anyway, just- So he, maybe what does he believe? I mean- uh, uh, Well, pr probably yeah. he has the same type of direction of thinking as, as you do. And he was the inventor of this uh, TJ model, which you, you just pointed right now, but uh, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I like, look, um, I think most of condensed matter physicists have worked on this project. To tell you the truth, I, I started to work on it like seven years ago. And at some point uh, we did it because we got this idea of emergent symmetry and there was charge order around uh, with Constantine. And then we got this kind of fancy theoretical ideas that we wanted to, to check. Uh, if I didn't get a new idea, like the, the field is tough. Uh, field is tough. You have all these big shots have their own ideas. Don't listen to you. <laughs> Experimentalists listen to you. But uh, theory, between theorists and uh, I'm not still at the level of seniority of those guys. Uh, so, okay, uh, at the end of the day, I think experiment, uh, it will settle down. There will be only one solution for this. 
which one it is, I don't know. And very quick question. I believe uh, there will be some pair density within the picture. That's pretty sure. Yes, there is a question. Yeah, there is. Uh, perhaps you know that Feynman and Wheeler once because uh, we were analyzing situation, considering situation that maybe in our universe there is only one electron. Going further with this, you may think of an electron in the solid, whatever it is, as a one wave. Yeah. One wave. Yeah. So then instead of speaking about particles, coupling, decoupling, etc., you may speak about property of this wave uh -huh. in volume in certain direction. Yeah. And when I was when I was hearing this, I'm not working in any of in any superconductors. I was thinking about what property should have as a wave to be easily moved through the space. And I think the over twisting num certain numbers in quantum chemistry should be exactly the same in, in some directions. I feel this in terms of quaternions, but you perhaps don't know this. I, I cannot switch immediately to the Dirac like you know, expression. Uh, actually, actually, this SU2 emergent symmetry can have a description in terms of quaternions. Oops. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in a sense, uh, you see, it's not it's not uh, your idea is not far from what we are doing. We are, I, I didn't talk to you about electrons at all. I talked to you about uh, bosons, I mean waves, uh, which is, uh, it can be particles, but uh, you have also uh, phases associated to- Sorry, I lost the beginning of your talk, so I didn't see this, yeah. yeah uh, thank you very much, sir. So look, uh, you have this SU2 rotations and in the paper you will find in our paper with Konstantin Yefetov that we could describe also in terms of quaternions. Uh, so uh, it's also a quadrupole, uh, a quadrupolar for, for the charge. So we, at the, we were having fun at the time. Uh, you know, it's exactly at the time where people dis discovered this, uh, these uh, waves uh, um, in, um, in the black holes uh, for, uh, in uh, cosmology. And uh, this was a quadrupole as well. So, I mean, nature likes those type of symmetry and likes to organize uh, the waves in terms of symmetries. So when you get an original ID, even for such a complex system as this one, um, I mean, it will, you will take ideas from some other fields and namely this confining ideas is coming from high energy physics, ideas and field theory are typical. typical. Uh -huh. Uh, Thank you very much. There is one thing we agree to, to be, uh, I think there is a consensus that say the competition between the charge density wave and uh, uh, the superconducting uh, orders uh, is not just a simple Ginsburg landau I think there is a, people agree on that. I mean, experimentalists would agree on that. So do you say that in, inside the vortex, there is a charge or skirmion because Inside the vortex in, in D-wave superconductors, you mentioned about some skirmions. What was uh, we? Yeah, yeah. My interpretation of the charge inside the vortex here. You see my screen, huh? Yeah. yeah. So it's a skirmion. Yeah. So namely, uh, the vortex is a topological defect in terms of this pseudo-spin uh, SU2 symmetry. This is a skirmion. So you see inside the vortex, I destroyed the superconducting order parameter. And uh, since my, I have a skirmion, my charge ordering parameter is going up. So here so is the skirmion representation. So you suggest there are two topological num numbers, quantization of magnetic hole flux plus a topological number responsible for skirmion. So you, you yes, suggest there's uh, more than one, you right? Know, you know, a simple vortex will be just a U1. Yeah, yeah. Uh, U1 symmetry, here I have an SU2. So indeed I get a skirmion. How yes. certain you are about this claim? I'm certain about the prediction now, uh, whether the, the experiment shows it, uh, shows a charge inside, whether it's a skirmion or not, the experiment will not tell you. I, I know that, 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 that there is some theory shows also existence of some ch small induced charge in vortices in low temperature in, and high temperature superconductors. But this effect is quite minor from the point of view of theory. I, I, I remember there was no, some- wait, 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 wait a second. This is, this is a big fact for, for us. So take, for example, take now niobium diselenide. Uh, inside the, the, you have niobium diselenide, uh, maybe we find it here. 
uh, well, it's not like that, but it has a five times bigger charge order than superconductivity. You sit inside the coexistence phase, you do the vortex, you don't see anything inside the vortex. So here we see something inside the vortex. So you have two ways to explain that. First, it, it shows, it proves experimentally that the two orders are in competition. Then you could say it's ginsburg lando competition is just a typical competition, or you could say it's something more fancy. So here I give you the solution with the skiamion is a, probably the simplest, most fun, more fancy solution. Namely that you have a constraint. Why I don't believe it's ginsburg lando It's because of this experiment where it's flat. So same idea, pseudo spin. I could, we've, we've tried to fit with ginsburg lando we try to fit with nonlinear similar model. With nonlinear sigma model, you give it, you have it for free, the flatness. So it, it very looks like you have a pseudo spin, that like you have this kind of constraint relying these two orders, making a kind of a, a pseudo spin out of the two. With a pseudo spin, you will get a skirmion. That's a prediction. And the skirmion can explain, uh, of course, the presence of charge order inside, but it's not, let's say, it's not a smoking gun. The observation is, um, it doesn't kill the theory, but the, the theory is, you see, uh, you could just the observation of charge order inside, it could also be explained by ginsburg lander This I don't think could be explained by ginsburg lander Is it clear? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for uh, clearing. Like, at the me. moment, um, experimental is doing STM. They have uh, made huge, huge progress. Uh, and uh, maybe we will be able to have a smoking gun uh, experiment for the constraint who is looking at this order. Thank you very much, but I have Thank to interrupt you. your discussion. Yes, it seems uh, we can speak about this uh, mysterious. Yeah, this is a nice uh, for, ideas, days, uh, yes? for bubbling yeah. ideas. This is a nice playground. This is nice. It's completely different from your playgrounds, but uh, you see, these cube rates have been used uh, for cold fusion. So I want to mention that uh, at MIT recently. So, I mean, you make these fantastic theories for a very mysterious state of matter, and, but they can still have a very strong application. Okay, yes. I remember how enthusiastic we were when these cube rates were discovered yeah. 35, 35 years ago. So, and I, now I realized how difficult is this field. And uh, yeah, most yeah. probably we need additional 30 years to well, what... probably we need that a new generation uh, set, settles. Yeah. It. it will settle. Uh, but for, frankly, you give a conference, and when the day of Cupret is coming, this is a hot day. I mean, still people like to chat, to fight with ideas, with concepts, with experiments. You have so many experiments, so many ideas, so many. This is fun. Well, thank, you, thank you very much for your presentation.